I was a performer today, and I'm an ASU graduate from 2022, BFA in Dance Education. I'm currently a principal dancer on Stilo Dance Company, and I'm also the co-director of Stilo Dance Kids Program. Hi, um, my name is Rajita Bharatan. I'm a Bharatanatyam dancer and a physical therapist. Um, I also teach dance and I also work as a therapist. Hi, I'm Mary Fitzgerald. I'm a professor of dance at Arizona State University and I'm also a massage therapist slash body worker and somatics practitioner. Um, so I'm supposed to facilitate, I believe, our panel today. Uh, and what I would love to do is to hear from Radhita and Soji um, about their practices and about how um, different somatics and or, in your case, physical therapy practices inform your work. Okay. So um, first I want to talk about Bharatanatyam. So Bharatanatyam, um, go, is as old as 2,000 years. It started 2,000 years ago, about 2,000 years ago. Um, and it has um, three different um, movements in it. To keep it very simple, there's a pure dance form where you just dance the different moves. You sit down, you stand, you run, you twirl, you run, you jump. And then there is also um, the Abhinaya piece, which is where you express or mind through your face, your body, your movements. And then there is a combination of both, um, and sometimes a storytelling too. So uh, this is the basis uh, about Bharatanatyam, the dance form, which is an Indian classical dance form, one of the Indian classical dance forms from India. Um, the basic Postures. So today I'm just going to talk about two basic postures that we use in Bharatanatyam and um, the muscles that should be engaged and what happens when you do not use those muscles and um, what kind of injuries you can have because of that. Um, the first position that I want to talk, which is the basic, basic position in Bharatanatyam is an Araymandi. So when you say Are Mandi, that is literal meaning is half sitting posture, which means you sit down with your hips open, flexed and externally rotated, your knees bent, and your feet turned out. Similar to a demi plie in ballet, but not the same. The reason why it's not the same is you go down to almost half your height. And that is your basic position, and that's where you start learning your basic steps. And you dance in that position. So ideally, in that, to get that position, um, your feet has to be turned out, your knees have to be bent, and your hip has to be opened up. So sometimes what happens is when students, or even professional dancers, um, they don't pay attention to what muscles to engage. They usually think it's your quads, so you get a nice knee bent, or it's a good ex uh, flexion, dorsiflexion, plantar flexion of your ankle, and you open it up. But what one needs to understand is there are more muscles that are engaged for you to be in that position so that you can dance without having any injury. So for example, if you don't have a full opening of your hip, then what you do is you turn your knee, like you externally rotate your tibia, this bone, more to keep that position and to open up your, turn out your foot in this position. And when you start dancing in that position without engaging your hip external rotators or your hip flexors, then, um, the in, then your knee starts to hurt. And most, about 57% of uh, dance injuries, um, the knee pain is the most prominent one. So that is one position that I wanted to talk about. The other position is um, the hand position, which is called the Natyarama. So you also keep your hand like this in most of your movements. So when you do this, 
people think it is lifting your hand up, bending your elbow, and straightening. So when you, so the muscles that you engage here is the muscles on on your scapula to retract and to pull your scapula back. So you have a nice length of your um, uh, neck, and then you internally internally rotate your um, shoulder, flex your elbow, and then uh, wrist extension or the neutral position. When you dance like this, you don't injure. But say you have tight pectorals. You come in this form and now your teacher is asking you to do this. So there's only so much you can move. So you're trying to move your shoulder back and in, in return what you do is you hyper you have a hyperlordotic position and then that can cause back pain. So these are the two positions where uh, we normally use in dance and those two positions are uh, the ones uh, that we use a lot and if you don't engage the right kind of muscles, you end up injuring yourself. So in order, in order to understand um, how to do this dance form without injuring, you need to understand what are the muscles you're actually engaging. If you know what muscles you're engaging, then the opposite direction of muscles should be in balance with the muscles that you're engaging. So both strengthening and flexibility is important in these muscles. So the, the, these are the basic things that I wanted to talk about before we start our discussion um, in relation to Bharatanatyam dance. Thank you. Wow, that was, that was a lot of information. Good information. I feel like it, um, it almost, it coincides. I feel like all dance forms have their own placements, right? Like your ballet, but in salsa, when you were saying the lats and the scapula, that's a lot of where the frame is being held when you're connecting with another salsa dancer. So a lot of the times we'll see in followers when there's a lack of connection between the two dancers because there's a lack of engagement in that muscle. But in the dancer's mind, they're thinking my arm is up so I'm connecting with them. But it's not the arm that's connecting, it's the entire back. It's the entire, it's the entire frame that your upper body can create. If you were a bird, imagine that your arms are wings and you have to fully expand to take flight. And if it's only half of the wing, it's not gonna really fly. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the time when we're, do, when we're dancing and there's a lead who's attempting to signal, I'm gonna give you a right turn, the follows know the footwork pattern so they'll turn themselves, and it appears that they're following them. But when you, when you try to get into more complex patterns, you can see that they're hurting themselves because the wrist is broken or because there's a lack of connection from the shoulder to the rib cage. So I think um, the hardest part when teaching new dancers is making them realize just because you look like you're doing it doesn't mean you're actually engaging in the right areas to connect with them. And how to handle that lightly so that they don't take offense to what well, you're telling me I'm doing that wrong. It's not wrong, it's just not engaging in the right area. Yeah. Do you, do you need me to use this? Can I just talk? Well, I was actually going to ask you if there's some way we can, if people don't mind coming up yeah, forward, it's okay. Great. Kids are always... In between such two different dance forms. So I practice contemporary modern dance, and what's interesting to hear is the focus on the upper body, the pectoral girdle, right? In our form, we would often talk about the center. So I'm just curious, like how much, when you talk about the pectoral girdle and the issues that happen with holding the arms a certain way, do you ever consider the connection to the center? And where, where is the movement powering from? Um, just because in contemporary dance, one of the things we often think contemporary and modern is that the arms come from the back and they come from the center. So I'm curious. Yeah. Okay. So like I said, um, the basic posture is array multiple, the half sitting posture, and then hands up. So you're using your back, your upper back, your pectorals, you're opening the hips. But most of your dance is centered at the core. So if you have um, strong back extensors, 
but weak abdominals. You're not going to get that position. And so you're going to end up, in order to have like straight body and that sitting position, the Devi Kriya, kind of, and dancing, you end up moving your back, you, you hyperextend your back to have that straight position and you end up having back injuries. So core is important, even when you're doing like a little step, like you know, thrusting your foot down on the floor. I always tell um, my students, and I also always keep that in mind, that you start with your core, like you work your core muscles. Um, you also have to use your back extensors and all of them, but if you focus on your core, then you're not hurting your leg. Any movement for that matter, if, if you just use your knee, the quads, hands, the, um, the calf muscles to hit, and when you st stay in that position and use your core to thrust, the, the movement itself is strong without hurting you. Yeah. So core is really important. Because mm -hmm. you're using that to support you, yeah. Um, I think core is also, I mean, core is always important. We do like a song of abs each rehearsal, but when we're dancing, one instructor almost told me like, think about cutting down the center here and are uh, like right, right in the midsection. So as the arms are moving, the hips are also moving, but they're not going technically the same way as cross lateral. And um, I think when you're dancing with a partner, you have to know how to keep your center, but also you have like a second center, if you will, and it's between the two dancers. So as they open up, you have to keep that center together. So if they're rotating their shoulders and pulling you across, how do you keep that proximity with them to have that center, but also keeping your own center? because say that they're gonna prep you for a double turn and you start to fall out of it and your body's going this way, then you just move the entire center backwards and you're falling out of the turn, you're losing the connection with them and then it makes it harder to get back in. So I think core is very important. I think center goes with that core though and then knowing how to find the center between two partners. and. And some people think, well, if I have all this space to dance, I'll get through the dance easier. But usually less space is better when dancing with a partner because then you guys can actually share each other's connection and the, and the core and the center is almost stronger. Yeah. Yeah, you're using mm -hmm. leverage differently. Yeah. Um, okay, so can I come back to you? Um, so when you talk to dancers about, you know, the correct positions and how to engage which muscles, do you mainly speak in terms of muscles, like engage between your shoulder blades, so yes. not here? Yes. Uh -huh. yeah. So, um, obviously, the students are not going to know what hip external rotators mm -hmm. are, or, you know, so I would use layman terms. Um, so one main thing that I've noticed is our bodies are so different. Even though the texts say that this is the position, Araymandi, you go half down, your knees have to be bent, your foot should be opened up fully, your feet have to be turned out fully. But not everyone who has a full uh, opening of hip can do that full opening of the feet. So it's very, very important to know how much can you open, how much your body will allow you to open at this point of time and work from there. So I have um, specific ways that I ask them to do it. Uh, one is I'll ask them to stand straight. You want me to demonstrate? Okay. So I'll ask them to stand straight like this. Then I will ask them to pull up their knees up engage your core, and then open as far as you can, and then sit. So when you do this, the knee is bent right above your feet. Now this is, say, for a person, this is all the hip opening that they have, and this is all how much they can sit. I work from here and I teach them how to open their hips more. 
If I ask that student to open the feet more to turn out, they will either do this, which is opening from the feet, mm -hmm. or they will extend or externally rotate the knee. Mm -hmm. Then you strike in this position. Mm -hmm. You there is more ground reaction force, and there's more um, um, there is more injury to the knee. Mm -hmm. You're likely going to injure your knee more. Mm -hmm. So I go with that person's amount of flexibility. Then maybe incorporate a little bit more, you know, exercises to open up, to engage, and teach them what engaging means. Mm -hmm. I can't say engage your core. Mm -hmm. right. I have to teach them ways to engage the core. Mm -hmm. And then maybe when they are a certain age, they will understand what I'm trying to tell them. Mm -hmm. But I'll just show them some exercises. Like this was one, but there is other one. You know, you sit in long sitting, and just ask them to hold opposite hip. Tell them that this opposite hip cannot move. And then you turn this hip as far as it goes. So say it goes only up to here. Then I ask them to lift, put it down. Lift, put it down. At no time will this hip move. That means they're not compensating from the opposite hip. So that will actually strengthen their external rotation and then when they sit in Aramandi it gets a little bit more better. Mm. You work from there. Then you teach them another set of exercises. That's how I try to get get them to get that position. Not everybody can do a full turn of their foot and not everybody will have a full opening of the hip. So we just need to work. If you work like that, they dance better, they injure less, mm -hmm. and it's not too hard on their body, especially their young bodies. Mm -hmm. That's what I do. Great, thank you. So what do you do to teach that sense of the center between two people? To find the center? I think I... Well, when I'm trying to find it just with somebody else, I really focus on how we're connecting. It's almost like we're creating a big ball of circle together, and we almost move in a circle. So if we're moving together, we can sort of create that new center. Because as we're moving through space, it'll move, but it's okay as long as we're holding each other and finding the frame. But even if we open up into an open frame, we still move where the center is, and we have to establish it together. I think it's a lot of proximity, um, closeness. I, I felt like when I started, I used to be afraid to get really close when dancing social dances because there's like that the stigma of like, oh, they came to dance, they want to talk to somebody, like that, that little bit of fear. But it's um, when you understand that you're sharing a moment, that you're able to really just enjoy the other person dancing, you can find that center together and it's comfortable. It's in between the frames. Um, it's not always there. I will say that the center is not always there and that's okay because you'll lose it, but then you can re-find it. And it's not, it's not always going to be in the same spot and it moves with you guys. I don't wanna say it's directly in between you, but it kind of is. Um, and as, as you're traveling through space with each other, it will tilt to be closer to one than the other, but then it'll re-center itself. Nice. Um, can I continue talking with you? So, um, what are some of the most common injuries you see in your practice? That's a great question. Uh, I want to say shoulder injury. Shoulder injury in follows is very common, and because if if the follow is not listening and it's hard because it's this idea of submission when you're listening to somebody you have to submit to what they're guiding to you it is an offering but it's it's very difficult to just listen and not want to dance what you want um, and so when the leads become forceful through a turn let's say and the arm isn't connected it's possible to overextend in the middle of a turn and this, over time, creates a lot of tears in the shoulder blade and it'll become painful to even want to pick the arm up. 
So a lot of, uh, even when we're having rehearsal and uh, we're getting through a very hard section, you go through a double, you catch and you go for a triple. If you're not prepared and you're not centered, you're gonna allow that hard yanking and cranking of the arm to throw it and overextend it. Um, and I felt it and it's really painful and it's, it's, not, it's not gonna be with every dancer, but that's when you have to communicate with whichever lead you're dancing with and like, I need less power and more like spin of the finger. And sometimes it's just because the, the circle that they're creating with their arm is so big the body's not really making these big circles. It's very centered, it's very small. And if the follow isn't listening, the lead thinks she needs more power. She can't feel it. But it's really, they're just not, uh, they're just not allowing that signal to go through. Mm -hmm. Listening. Yeah, yeah. listening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, any questions before we go on? Because I, I could talk to them all day. This, it's very fascinating to hear about your practices, but I just want to open up. Is anything occurring to anyone that they would like to ask? Yes. I have a, I have a question. Uh -huh. um, she brought up a question. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm curious about, you brought up stigma, right? For example, the uh, two people dancing like in a social setting. I want to ask also Rajita about if there is a stigma that can be attached or that's already attached that we need to break through um, in terms of Bharatanatyam. I can think of more female, um, going more in a female thing, more, more female than Bharatanatyam dances, right, than male. So, yeah. So. You mean to say stigma, meaning uh, female dancers dancing with male dancers? No, no, no. More as in maybe male dancers are not pursuing Bharatanatyam as much as they would be before compared to his history, maybe? So... Um, or I'm wrong. I don't know. Correct me. The, the number of female dancers to male dancers, definitely more female dancers than male. Yeah. Uh, but there are a lot of male dancers coming up now good to know taking it up um also it's you know the social cultural aspect to it how you know uh, when 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 a girl says she wants to dance mostly correct me if i'm wrong mostly they'll be like yeah you can dance you can join this class and as soon as a boy says that he wants to dance they're like why not sports you know maybe that is changing now you know at least my son learns bharatanatyam so it is changing but um, majority of people in India still think in that way. But there are a lot of dancers, male dancers coming up now, so I, I'm hoping that there are more male dancers in future. So yeah, social, cultural aspects. Thank you. Yeah. Do you need this? Or? Yeah. Yes. yeah. Uh, I have a question because uh, the great discussion is somehow related to my profession as well. One of my expertise is ergonomics, which is human factors, and then the posture. And, and I see among dancers we have probably a phenomenon like RMI, that we call repetitive motion injuries. That happens because of overuse of the limbs and muscles, and also standing in a very awkward posture or a steady posture for some times and this frequency down the time it will, it will get you. So what I'm thinking about what are the most efficient ways that you have in your career because it's not one time and you know that impacts are usually accumulative. Mm -hmm. It's not going to happen one time, one month right. down the road. What are the best practices that you have in order to prevent those? Like the performance that you, you showed about the knee, is practical, I have all the pressure of your body on your knee. And somehow we have a position, we call it stagger stance, that you have one, one of your foot in the front rather than both of them on the same line, with minimizing this pressure. I'm just looking to see if there are any best practices that are recommended for 
improving or minimizing this impacts from our dancers? Thank you. What advice would you give for people so that they can prevent some of these issues? Yeah. So, um, I'm going to talk about Bharatanatyam Indian classical dance. In that perspective, it is seen that the dance form itself is seen as um, a prayer. Um, so, dancers as such, they don't think, they think of themselves as artists, but they don't think of themselves as athletes. So there is very little uh, practice of warm-up before exercise and a cool-down after the dance practice. So my advice would be a warm-up, <laughs> then practice a cool-down. Warm-up, not static stretching. Warm-up to increase your heart rate. It really warm-up. Like you could do dynamic stretching, not static stretching. That's one advice. Second thing, our dance form itself, uh, we don't wear any footwear. We are dancing on bare feet, on hard floors. So the ground reaction forces more when you're jumping, leaping, so that the incidence of injuries are going to be more. How can you prevent that? You can change the flooring where you're dancing. That's my second um, suggestion. And the third one is, in the dance form itself, there's a lot of striking of the foot and pushing your foot out. For certain aspects, maybe you can strike harder, but you don't have to strike harder every single time, but rather show the intention of the movement. For example, your first basic, like the basic steps are called taktaru, meaning hitting the feet on the floor. But you don't have to hit it hard but you can show how the step needs to be. The intention of the step can be shown instead of hitting hard. And that way you can stop some of the repetitive injuries that can happen in ankle. There are so many other positions and so many other movements. We can keep talking how we can change so that you can um, not injure yourself and you can dance for longer years. But these are some of the basic things that we can change to um, avoid injuries. Thank you. So cheap. Thank you. Yeah, great question. Um, yes to the warm up. Always warm up. Always warm up. I think we, since as a standing dance, I mean, there are a majority of them are standing dances, but we think, oh, I'm already doing my basic, I'm warm. And then at the end, you're hurting a lot more because you didn't actually go through all of the body movements. I, I like to, I leave the warm up right now with Stilo and I'll focus on all of the joints. So I'll give like all of the rotations in each every joint and do all the ranges of motion. And then a lot of undulations and then a core, um, a song of just core and ab work to really like heat up the center before we actually start doing our basics. Um, I think a lot of another way to like prevent injury is where you're dancing and what you're wearing as you dance. Salsa dancers, there's a lot of spinning, so you don't want to wear sneakers with a lot of friction on the ground because it's going to tear up your knees. So you buy the suede shoes. Ladies are usually in heels, so knowing that you need to put your weight into the balls of your foot and practice um, those calf raises and getting calf muscles ready to be up there because if they're not, it's going to be harder and you're going to rely on your heels, which is going to send all the weight backwards. So it's just repetition of the right practices. And yes, to cooling down afterwards, even if it's just laying on the floor and doing some soft stretches, it is a full body dance. So you want to get the entire body, not just touch the toes. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I think it, in every practice, I think the warm up and the cool down is the hardest part. You know, the discipline of it um, and to take that on yourself. I, I'm 60 and my warm up, I hate warming up. I've warmed up a million times in my life. I don't want to warm up anymore. <laughs> but if I don't warm up for 90 minutes, like slow, deep warm up, I, I'm not going to be able to dance that much longer. So thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much, Sochi. Thank you. Woo!